listening to the Mark Bradford Alchemy for Life podcast. I want to tell you two things today. Well, hey there. Welcome back. I want to tell you two things today. I want to tell you that depression is portable and depression is not what you think it is. Unlike in the movies and in drama shows, when someone is depressed or they're suffering from depression, they don't necessarily sit on a non-chair in a corner in a darkened room as the sun goes down, as they forget to turn the lights on with their hand covering their face and their faces in their lap and they're immobile for hours. They may not necessarily stay in bed all day. It's because it's portable. You see, remember when I talked to you in a previous podcast, and I have mentioned this before, that I find that the happiest people that you meet are people who know what zero is. I don't know if you've ever heard me say that. If you've, but if this is the first time you're hearing me say that, let me let me elaborate. So in the scale of, you know, what's really crappy in your life and what's fantastic, everyone has their scale and they know, you know, oh, that's a two, that's a one, that's a 10, that's a zero, right? Happiest day in your entire life, you'd say is a 10. The worst day is a zero, right? There are people that have never really had terrible times. So their zero is like your five. Uh, the younger someone is typically the more likely that's going to be. Now, of course, there are exceptions. People have had absolutely horrible childhoods or have terrible things happen to them, right? If, you've, if you're one of these people, you know what I'm talking about. So when you meet someone that has resilience because they have gone through hard times and you and they are maybe going through something a little bit rough or just kind of a crappy day, they seem to completely shrug it off because they've been through far, far worse. They know where zero is. And that's what I've said. Those people know where zero is. So in the same vein, in understanding that there's a scale, imagine that there are people out there, and you might be one of them, that your best day in a long time has been a two. That's a good day. That's not even a good day. That's an exceptional day. Your standard day is a one. Because nothing happens. Because you're just suffering. Because you, you, you lack what you desire. Because you are just in a really bad place. And the stresses and happenings in your life just just make it worse. And you never can quite regenerate from that because you have nothing to regenerate from. Now, for people who are lucky to be surrounded by friends and family and coworkers and, and other things in their life that keep them not only busy, but validated and energized, those people typically are going to have better days. Let me make a, a disclaimer really quick before we go on, because there's probably a few people thinking this. So to those people, I I'm, don't want to get into the whole DSM-4 criteria for depressive disorder, nor do I want to necessarily talk at length about really the nine types of depression that, or seven types, depending on who you talk to that are out there. I'm talking about something specific and something that's fairly common. So as I was saying before I interrupt myself, the people that are suffering from this, and it's certainly suffering, their depression comes with them. The sadness, this depression, this lack of reaching any emotional heights, this lack of, of happiness or even smiling throughout a day or two or three or five, it comes with them. They may not want to get out of bed, but they get out of bed. They may not want to cook dinner, but they do. They may not want to exercise, but they still may. But they're still sad. And the exercise and the food and interaction with other humans and things like that certainly may give them a much better day. It may even energize them a little bit and, and, and serve to recharge them a little bit. But their default, their baseline for their existence is something like a one. As opposed to for you, it's probably something, if all things considered, if you were to compare, might be a seven. 
your basic day may be a seven. And you may say, oh, come on, I'm not living, I'm not a king in a castle and surrounded by gold. No, you're not. But you may be a husband in a house filled with love, surrounded by family and a good job. And there are people out there who don't have that. Or you may be someone who is in perfect health, works out all the time, gets their endorphins going, and has their entire future ahead of them. By comparison to someone else, you may be a seven. So this leads me, this portability of depression leads me into my second point. Because it goes with them, which means they may pass you by hundreds of times a day. You may pass by people who are feeling this way, who are just skating by on their ones and twos. And they're not skating by because they're not putting effort into it. They're skating by because that's all the energy life is giving them presently. And you may pass them in a drive through or in a store. They may be somebody in the other room in your house. <laughs> they may be someone you know really well that you speak to fairly often because it's portable. So the second point is this is what those people are not going to do. When they're feeling this way, which is essentially constantly, they're not going to say, well, I'm feeling really down. I have no energy. I just, I really could use a talking to. I could really just use like a friend. I think I'll call my friend up and say, hey there, how you doing? I, um, I'm really depressed. Let's talk about it. <laughs> That's not going to happen. It doesn't work that way. In much the same way that when people go through hard times who are typically not depressed, they're typically, for the most part, not going to reach out and say, hey, I'm going through a really hard time. I, I could use a friend. There are exceptions. People do that once in a while, and that's awesome. But people who are just suffering through life and, and their slippery slope of sadness continues downward and downward and downward in a spiral until they're at like a 0.5 in life and, and their scale of how happy they are. And, and, and what those people are not going to reach out. So you have to. So let me ask you a few questions. Are you one of those people? If you are one of those people, I want to talk to you again at the end of this. So I want to talk to you if you're the friend of one of those people or you're someone who's not one of those people. So if you if you're fine, as far as you know, is there a friend that sort of disappeared? Is there a friend that says they're okay? They say, I'm okay. Yeah. Eh. Eh. Last couple days have been hard. Eh. I don't know. Is there, is there answer typically to turn the conversation back to you? Because maybe you could ask them where they've been. Or maybe you could ask them truly how they are and maybe push a little harder. Maybe push uncomfortably a little harder. Because if they're really your friend and you're really their friend, there's a lot of room in your relationship for this pushing and shoving. Because it comes from a place of, of kindness. No one's going to say, I don't want to be your friend anymore because you thought I was depressed so you pushed really hard to make sure I was okay. It, it doesn't work that way. So I want you to take a minute out and think about that. And I'm not necessarily saying, stop what you're doing, look around the room and go, oh, nobody's here. I guess we're fine. I, I don't, I'm saying take a little bit of time to think about that. Your friends, your family, people that you interact with on a fairly regular basis. I'm not asking you to be an armchair psychologist. Oh, like you, Mark? No, I'm just trying to interact with you. <laughs> I'm not asking you to be this armchair psychologist and go out into the world and say, hey, that guy looks pretty sad. I'm going to go and, and sit next to him. <laughs> I mean, there are stories like that and stuff like that does happen, you know, but that's like a, a very extreme example of like good intuition. I'm not saying that. I'm saying in your own world. I'm saying that one person in your world that, yeah. And you are not going to swoop down out of the heavens and fix their entire life but you may make them feel that it, their life is actually worthwhile. You also may prevent something absolutely horrible from happening because you cared, because you asked an uncomfortable question 
and because you just decided that things have been a little too quiet. I hope this gave you something to think about. I hope it did. And if you're one of the people who is suffering, I'm coming back to you like I promised. Um, know that it is just difficult and not intuitive for the people around you to say, hey, how you doing? Hey, you do seem sort of sad. Hey, you want to come over for dinner? I know it's kind of weird. It's un difficult, uncomfortable, and unusual for those people. And I understand that sometimes you reach out and go, hey, how are you doing? With the extreme hope where you're crossing your fingers going, God, I hope they ask me how I'm doing. God, I hope we can expand on that. I don't know how to expand on it. I don't know what to even say. I, I don't have this major problem in my life, but I just, I just, there's just nothing. I hope that you find the strength to keep those connections to those people. And please keep listening. And thank you to everyone for listening. Take care of yourselves and others. Hey there, thanks for listening. I always appreciate your feedback. I really, really do. Wanted to let you know that the Sword in the Sunflower audiobook won as Best New Author for 2020. My podcast is available wherever you consume podcasts, and my books are available on Amazon. Take care.